Pro-Life Talk. Real world answers. This is Life Report. Welcome to Life Report. I'm your host, Gabby Veers, and I'm sitting here talking with Josh Brom and Megan Allman from Life Training Institute. Yay. We are talking about the Kermit Gosnell trial. Um, Often as a pro-life advocate, I find it easy to get into conversations about abortion whenever I'm on a college campus or I'm presenting for an event. But in my day-to-day life, I don't often have an opportunity to talk about the issue of abortion with my friends. Um, my co-workers are all pro-life. <laughs> it's, it's an awkward yeah. subject to just bring up to people that are not in the pro-life movement already. It's a little bit, it seems right. weird to people. Right. And so I think when we have a current event, like with what's going on with the Gosnell trial, we have a great opportunity to um, start discussions on this issue. Josh, in fact, trained some of our volunteers when we went out to Fresno City College to talk about this issue. So Josh, how did you train people to bring up this this issue? And, and what are some tips for pro-lifers to, to use this current event as a springboard to start conversations? Yeah, well, I'm always really interested in trying out new things to put on campuses to see if it'll work. And so we set up a poll table. We were on campus two days. And unfortunately, we only did this on the second day where there was a lot less foot traffic. But we set up a poll table that just said, should Dr. Kermit Gosnell be in jail? Hmm. Yes or no. We tried. We thought. We thought about a different, few different versions. But my my guess was that most of the students at Fresno City or most colleges still don't know who Kermit Gosnell is. Right. And so I wanted to get a. I wanted. I wanted to get him asking who is that guy basically. So by asking should he be in jail, I felt like it was a maybe or, or in prison was a pro- provocative enough question to maybe get people curious enough to ask us. Mm-hmm. Who's this guy that you're talking about? Um, and it did. And so people would come by. And I had a conversation there and I was training people there. But basically, you know, people would ask, who, who, is, who is Dr. Kermit Gosnell? And, and I felt like we needed to know enough, like not everything. You don't need to have read the entire grand jury report. But you need to know at least kind of some minimal facts about Gosnell. And so I'll just say, since I know that we're on radio, um, this is generally a show. It's not the greatest show for kids anyway, but this is especially one. If you've got little kids listening, I would say this is go ahead the time to um, either turn off the radio or get them into a different room because there's just no pretty way to talk about um, this trial. It's, it's pretty gruesome. So having said that, um, I was training people to basically just say, Dr. Kermit Gosnell is an abortionist from, from Philadelphia who's on trial for a lot of different things. Um, A few women died. Uh, There's a woman that died from an overdose. He was using drugs uh, badly. In fact, we think he was probably even selling them illegally. Uh, But then as uh, we also, as, as inspectors came in, they found a lot of other kind of really horrific things about his clinic. It was really dirty. There was cat poop, you know, out. There was, uh, he was using sometimes the same instruments on women, you know, throughout the day without cleaning them. So like several women have STDs now uh, because of the way he was doing abortions. Um, We know he also did late-term abortions. And uh, some of the abortions he was doing were illegal. He was actually birthing babies and then snipping their neck. He called it snippings, where he would actually... Uh, sever their spinal cord in the, in the back of their neck, basically an almost decapitation. Um, we know that some of these babies were viable. Some of these babies at least once screamed uh, in response. And we know there's at least one story. I basically picked what's the, one of the worst things we know is there's at least one story of, of um, a, a baby being birthed into a toilet and it actually trying to swim out before he or his, I think in this case it was his nurse that killed this baby by snipping it in front of his mom. So what I did there was I didn't tell all the different things that we know. There's a hundred or more horrific things we know about him. But I just basically picked a few so it's not to kind of overwhelm this person, but I picked probably five things. He hurt women. His clinic was really dirty. He was spreading STDs, but he was also killing late-term babies. And here's a few of the really gruesome things we know about that, just a couple. And, and those are the ones that I picked. So then people's response is obviously, oh my gosh, I can't, that's horrible. You, almost always, that's horrible, right? And so then we would ask a question of, uh, if you think that's horrible, do you think that's horrible because there were a few women that died, like because he was hurting women or spreading STDs? Or do, are you also reacting that way because of what he did to babies, too? Because if they only think, well, I just hate that he wasn't treating women well, like he should 
have used clean instruments every time or whatever. Well, that's okay. Now we have, now we know the conversation we need to have. But ho- I'm hoping to find common ground. Can we agree that what you did to babies is really bad, right? This is like basically a common ground kind of conversation. And if people said yes, and usually they said yes, I, I'm also bothered by what he did to babies, we would ask a very specific question. If we modified one thing about what he did, if the only thing differently that Gazna was doing was killing them that way while they were still in the womb, would you be more comfortable with that? Mm-hmm. And not in an accusatory, like, would you be okay if you just did it this? Like, it's just like, I'm just trying to get a gauge of kind of where you're coming from. Um, if so there, so are ahead. you trying to make a distinction between trimesters of abortion or just the location of, of when it, it happened? Good question. At this point, I'm, ask, I'm asking a location question. It was okay. usually my first question. It's not going to be probably my only one. Um, but I can't, it's kind of an easy starter. Um, it, it, it's very easy for the approach. A lot of times, okay, we will ask all these questions, approaches people, what, what if it was this and what if it was this and what if it was this different? Yeah. A lot of times if they haven't thought about abortion a lot, it can be a little bit hard to keep up. So this is kind of a really easy starter. Okay. What if there's a location difference? If it was inside of her body, would it have been okay? And if they say yes, by the way, there's a lot of different possible reasons they might say that. If they're coming from a bodily rights perspective, then basically the entire moral equation changes based on whether it's inside her body or outside her body. Um, or if they believe that um, if they believe that location matters and that would change it. Um, but it could be something else. It might be that the only reason that they have a problem with it is because some of the babies were viable, like past 23 weeks or so. Um, I want to know that. Um, I'm not going to be like, oh, you're a despicable person if you're against, you know, uh, only killing post-viable babies. I just know, okay, let's talk about whether viability matters. So it sounds like the first step, if you're going to bring up this issue, is to just kind of go into fact-finding mode Mm -hmm. about the person you're talking with. What are their beliefs about abortion and what makes this kind of incident wrong. Yeah, and trying to find a way to talk about you don't want to, you got to try to find, and it's a little bit difficult, you don't want to be weird. Like this is all our, like kind of our motto, don't be weird. You're talking about a weird topic and a really horrific story from that topic. And so there's kind of this danger of coming across as a weirdo. You want, you want to try to come across as normal, but a really caring human being. This is a really, really horrific thing that happened. This guy is a barbarian. Right. I'm sorry. Like, almost everyone can agree. Most pro-choice people agree what this guy was doing was deranged. Mm-hmm. So, like, you're trying, I think, like, the attitude we ought to have is there's this really horrible person that's coming out of the news, just like the way we were talking about uh, horrible people that, about other stories. I, th- I think what, 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 what I would hope is that pro-life people could, could talk about this guy. You, you don't want to be weird. Our, our whole, you know, yeah. our, kind of our running <laughs> motto is don't be weird. And it's hard because abortion already is a w- weird thing to talk about in general. And then we're also, as a springboard into the conversation, talking about one of the most horrific and gruesome stories that have come out of the abortion issue ever, really. I mean, this mm-hmm. this rivals partial birth abortion debates. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had those conversations, and these are really helpful conversations to have. We were talking about what abortion does to babies and not just, you know, uh, privacy and, 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 and women's rights. And so um, that's helpful. You just, I was, so I, I, in my mind, I'm thinking, like, if we could talk about this guy and just say, okay, but he, he did was really, really horrible. It really it affects me on an emotional level, not just a philosophical, you know, uh, rights level. In this kind of the same way, I and mean, we we're talking about like the way we might talk about the the the, the, the Sandy Hook shooter. Uh-huh. Um, we wouldn't say like, oh, I just hope this guy goes to hell, and like we would say like like the kind of things like you would expect like Westboro Baptist Church to have like on a sign. Like that's not. We would say like, wow. What he did just makes me really sad. Isn't that horrible? And uh, boy, I'm just really sad about what happened. Look, look, at, look at what happened and, and, and what's, what was going on right. with the shooter. Mm-hmm. Like, why, why did he do this? Do we have any reasons to, to, to you know, to, do we have any, any way to know uh, why we think that this happened and mm-hmm. what should we do? Should there be more gun control laws or what, you know, whatever topic comes up, fine, let's talk about that. But, it's, but like, that's not too weird. Right? right, exactly. You're just you're being an informed citizen and contributing to something that's very important that's happened in our country. Yeah, the biggest thing is that you're talking about it. Um, mm-hmm. you know, if, we, if we scrape away some of all of this mess with the Gosnell trial, what we get to at the bottom of it is, um, as my coworker Jay Watts wrote in a recent blog post at LTI uh, that you can look up, 
uh, what he was getting at is this idea that people will try to say, well, this is not really about abortion. He's not just mm-hmm. on trial for abortion. Um, he's on trial for other things, all of which that's, that's true and needs to be kind of uh, cleared up and, and carefully handled. But bottom line is, as Jay said, we have, we basically cultured or, or fostered a culture where nobody wants to talk about in particular. And that's what got us into this mess. I'd go so far as to say in large part, you know, when you look at the, at the trial report, that's why the regulations were not happening as they were supposed to. People swept things under the rug. Mm. Why? Because it is about abortion and people don't want to talk about it. So what we have here, just like with Sandy Hook, um, is an opportunity. Well, the sad thing is we can't undo what's been done. Uh, just as with Sandy Hook and, and with the Kermit Gosnell trial, these are both atrocious things. Uh, but what's happening is the nation is is looking at it now. It's been uncovered. It's become it's in the open. Um, you know, I, I always think about when I present images to students, I tell them, you know, Greg Cunningham, who's a pro-life apologist, a, a great one, says a nation can or a culture can trivialize injustice so long as it never has to look at it. Well, yeah. everyone's looking at it right now. Everyone on either side of the issue, no matter where they fall or even on the spectrum, if you want to put it that way, uh, there is a very obvious response, an intuitional response we have, and that is revulsion and horror to what has happened. Um, and so, yeah, I think we take that and we take, take that response and go somewhere with it. But Josh, what I loved about what you're doing with your questions on campus is you're framing the conversation in a way that is constructive. Um, mm. So I think that is the case. I don't think it's weird to bring it up in that way, especially on uh, the great thing about the university campus is it, it is kind of the hub of the marketplace of ideas. Uh, right. And this is a great time to take it, you know, take advantage, not in a negative way, but take advantage mm-hmm. in a positive way of something that cannot be undone and talk about where do we go from here as humanity, um, morally and otherwise. Yeah. So not weird at all. I think you're right on about bringing up Sandy Hook is something, a springboard to be able to talk about yeah. mental illness or, or gun control or whatever comes from that situation that we need to look at. And the biggest thing is we can talk about it very carefully and we have the other person's attention because it's not in the abstract anymore. Mm-hmm. Right. It's not just words, it's there. That's a great point. That's a really great point that you're not in the abstract. So. Josh, when you've brought this up in the past, and Megan, perhaps as you've brought it up with maybe on Facebook, other people off a of college campus, how do you get it? How do you get the conversation to focus around the issue of abortion? How do you bring it back and separate the other horrors of this trial and look at the issue of abortion? Yeah, for me, so 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 I had a conversation, a really good conversation with a guy when we first sat at the table. A, a, a guy walked up. He signed. Uh, well, no, he didn't sign because he didn't know who. He was. <laughs> so yeah, asked who he was. And if it, it, it was, I just had to be really purposeful in, in how I led that conversation. Not, in, I don't, and I don't think this is a manipulative thing. It's just, it's very easy for pro-lifers to just have a conversation about how awful this one guy is. Right. That's not. I mean, and I, there's a little bit of good that comes with that. But I want, a, I want a lot more. I'm shooting for the gold. I want to have a conversation about all abortions, mm-hmm. and most abortions don't sound as gruesome mm-hmm. to pro-choice people as what Gosnell did. So once again, it's kind of starting with some hopefully some common ground, and like Megan said, in, in, in an ish, on an issue that's not abstract, that's happening, that's being talked about by most of the major media sources now. Finally, and. So it's just asking his questions. Um, are, are you uncomfortable with what he did to babies too, not just women? Mm-hmm. And then also, and then just asking him some kind of clarification questions. Just kind of asking, okay, for, for you, what is it that bothers you? Um, is it that it was happening sometimes outside the womb? Um, is it that the babies sometimes were viable? Is it that um, some of these babies could feel pain? Uh, the, 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 I mean, these are babies that were able to feel pain by just about almost every medical standard, you know, even the, some of the pro-choice groups will say, you know, look, I feel pain for sure starting by 24 weeks. Uh, we think easily 20 weeks, probably earlier. We'll be talking about more, more about that later on Life Report this year. Uh, either way, for some people, maybe that's the only reason they have a problem with it. Would have been, but then we can ask him, what if he anesthetized them first? Mm-hmm. Is it fine then? Right. Um, what if, you know, they weren't as, uh, as, so there's like, there's different areas that they might say, 
Well, here's the reason I've got a problem with it. If you ask them the right questions, don't lump them all in with everybody. All the, There are so many pro-choice people that have different reasons for being against what guys now did. Mm-hmm. You don't want to straw man them. You want to have a good conversation. So you've got to ask them a lot of questions to figure out what their view is so that then you can kind of narrow in on that and talk about that. I'm willing to have a discussion about whether viability matters morally. I'm willing to have a conversation about whether fetal pain matters. Is it is, is it so much worse to have an abortion on a baby that feels it than one who doesn't. I'm willing it, but at least now I know that's the conversation we should be having. I've been working in for the last month in classrooms nonstop. And so <laughs> okay. when sure. it comes up with students or uh, even with adults, because I've been doing trainings, uh, it's mostly how do how do we talk about it? So the same kind of thing we're, we're dealing with here. Uh, th- the way that I've been handling it is is exactly the way that, that Scott uh, Klusendorf has been handling it. And that is to say, we recognize the atrocity of what's taken place. No matter where you fall, everyone recognizes that. For those who want to have a conversation from that, uh, the, the key is not to focus squarely on Gosnell, but mm-hmm. to focus on how Gosnell relates to what's occurring every single day. Uh, so at LTI, what we're teaching them to do is to is to really use the training that we have just given them. It's no longer in the abstract for them right. either. So we can take you know, what is this this very atrocious example, focus in on the abortion part. Mm-hmm. As Josh pointed out, there are many different reasons why this was evil and why this was wrong as related to Gosnell and, and what went on in that Philadelphia clinic. Uh, but to focus in on how the abortion part of this relates to what is happening every single day. So we've got to keep our eye Mm. on the ball when it comes to the conversations. And Josh is beautifully showing how we can frame the conversation, how we can ask questions that draw out, well, what is the view? Uh, And and so we're really, again, taking just opportunity to shed some light on some important things. Well, it sounds like that then goes into my next question, which is how should pro-lifers not talk about the Gosnell trial? What should we avoid, Josh, when we we bring up this issue? Yeah, I think uh, there's a couple that come to mind. One of them was something that actually, so so Megan and I, uh, Megan actually came to Fresno last week and she spoke at, at our big Christian school, Yay. which was awesome. And we got to spend <laughs> a whole day just kind of talking about some of the next Life Report episodes that we wanted to do with her. And and Megan said something great, was was we don't want pro-lifers focusing only on what Gosnell did and acting like he's the poster child for all abortionists. Mm-hmm. Um, there's kind of some controversy about this within the pro-life movement because some people feel like, well, it's not just guys now. He's just the first one that got caught doing this. For all we know, there might be a lot of abortionists doing this. Maybe so. Um, mm-hmm. We don't know. It's hard when there's only so much that we know about what's going on. Either way, I know that about 90% of abortions happen in the first trimester. So that alone is going to be very different for pro-choice people's intuitions, usually, Mm -hmm. than what Gosnell was doing. There's a lot of things that was going on with the Gosnell issue that makes pro-choice people's intuitions kind of flare. That Mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily apply to first trimester abortions. And so I think... I think we don't want to only look at this and make that the goal is that I'm just going to try to get pro-choice people to have a quick conversation about guys now. I mean, there's some good that can happen there. But if you can take it deeper, make it go deeper. I think the other um, concern that I have, and this is the concern I had a couple of years ago when this story first came out, was that pro-lifers would be making an argument that abortion should be illegal because clearly it's unsafe. Like, look at the women that died and look at what Gosnell was doing. Because of Gosnell, this is why abortion should be illegal. That's a terrible argument and it's, and, and, and it's dangerous, even though for some people it might actually work. Right. Because no, what will happen... Go ahead. Mm-hmm. No, I was just going to say, just as... Uh, where did I read it? I, I can't remember, but the, you know, the, the, the pro-choice reaction at large is probably going to be to that is going to be, well, that is the perfect argument for government-funded abortion. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And keeping it legal, keeping it safe. You know, I mean, it just seems like for the, I mean, for the pro-life person, it just seems, well, obviously abortion should be illegal, right? But then for the pro-choice person, they're going to be like, okay, 
you're talking about this really unsafe thing that happened that doesn't sound that different from back alley abortions that we've been talking about, you know, right. that we believe happened pre row So mm -hmm. you're saying to make it safer, make it illegal? Like, that doesn't make any sense to pro-choice people. So I feel mm -hmm. like our argument shouldn't be that abortion's wrong because it hurts the economy. Abortion's not wrong because some women regret it later. Abortion's not wrong because you might have killed the next cure of cancer. An abortion is not wrong because some guys do really horrible things when their clinic has gone unchecked for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Abortion is wrong because it kills an innocent human being without justification, period, end mm -hmm. of story. Mm -hmm. And so if it, the, the, it's too easy mm -hmm. for pro-lifers to talk about this, this weird, very horrific, extreme story mm -hmm. and try to get everyone to agree on all abortions on that, that like that doesn't work you've actually got to bring it there and make an argument that's going to be a harder argument to make for pro-choice people it's easy to get common ground on guys now can you get them to agree with you that first trimester abortions should be illegal too because that's our goal right so when we're using this in conversation we want to make a bridge between the gosnell case and first trimester abortions i know sometimes it can be common for a pro-life advocate to then equivocate between the late term abortions and the first trimester abortions and for us it's the same thing but for the pro-choice person you're speaking with it's not the same thing in their mind yet so how do you help that individual bridge the gap that um, between children being killed on the operating table and first trimester abortions. I think what I'm going to, I think it's a great question. I think mm -hmm. what I want to do, I mean, I mean, you, you might end up talking specifically, it depends on your, on, on uh, you, how you like to do conversations. Cause kind of the, the two obvious modes are one, you could do what I said is kind of narrow down what, uh, what reason do they are they going to be against the Gosnell abortions but not other abortions? And then just talking specifically about those. Let's talk about viability and whether that matters. Let's talk mm -hmm. about fetal pain and whether that matters morally. Uh, let's talk about location or, 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 or maybe it's a bodily rights thing for them. The mm -hmm. other direction to go would be, and this is maybe in some ways easier, is to just make an equal human rights argument. The reason that we're against both first trimester abortions and the abortions that Gosnell is doing. And what's doing, happening to the women. And what's happening to the women is because we think think all human beings have an equal right to life. Right. Uh, and that's an easy argument to make. And, and the way we've been doing that on campus lately is just by saying, look, can we agree that all the human beings outside the womb have an equal right to life? If so, how do we explain that? Because we all have so many differences. Mm -hmm. There's tall people and short people. There's people in temporary comas. There's people in wheelchairs. There's, there's all these differences. There's smart people and not so smart people. Mm -hmm. If we all have an equal right to life, then there must be something that we all have equally and that we all have in common. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that I can think that we all have in common and all have equally is humanness, mm -hmm. is we have a human nature. And if that's what grounds our value, that completely explains the intuition that everybody has, <laughs> that human yeah. beings have an equal right to life. But that's the only way to get there. Mm -hmm. And so then we can say for us, like, I was, like let's, let me give you a peek behind the curtains of my brain or my mind. I think all human beings are equally valuable. So for me, while it's a little bit extra grotesque, that these babies were killed while they could feel the procedure, mm -hmm. I actually think it's pretty despicable that we're killing thousands of first trimester babies every day too uh, because, right. because I think human beings matter. Going back to the safe and legal issue, it seems like many pro-choice people could then say, well, this is why we shouldn't have so many laws restricting abortion because that will force women to go to clinics like um, Gosnell's clinic because maybe they're not going to have access because of more, rest more restrictive laws. Yeah, I mean, I, I am pretty open to hearing um, effective pro-choice talking points and, and, and rhetoric and thinking, oh, okay, I can see what they're doing there. I think that's going to be really persuasive. I think this talking point is not one of those. Um, I've, I've, this has been the response from like the head of NARAL and some other pro-choice leaders have gone out. Like I expected the pro-choice community um, to come out and say, we think this guy's don't think is horrible. Like if I was a pro-choice leader, right. basically I would come out and say, this is the worst thing we've ever heard of. This never happens. And we, and we should just make sure that abortion stays safe and legal. And, but they've gone a step further and are like blaming pro-lifers for passing incremental laws 
that that send women and and I don't, I guess I'm not I'm not connecting the dots. For me, I'm just like, hey, look, one of the things, the reasons that the Gosnell thing happened was that no one mm-hmm. looked at this clinic for 20 years. Right. Is your argument really that we need less oversight, not more? It seems like if I was the pro choice guy, I'm going to say I think that every state should pass a law that says that some unbiased government official does an annual inspection of every abortion clinic so we can prove to everybody that this is a weird exception. But for mm-hmm. them to argue, basically what Pennsylvania did was they passed a law in 2011, it took effect last year, that basically said every clinic's got to have an annual inspection. And they're angry about this. And I was like, what? Mm-hmm. And the other if thing to keep in mind- you care about women, why on earth would you be angry yeah, about this? Yeah, and that this? brings me to my other point, is, is, is if you read the grand jury report, there is at least one inspection that did take place of Gosnell's clinic, and it's a member of the NAF, the National Abortion Federation, that was considering having Gosnell come under their network of abortion clinics and who have certain standards. Mm-hmm. And generally, if they go into a clinic, an independent clinic, that isn't quite up to- up to snuff, then they basically say, okay, here's the five things you need to change, and so we'll come back and we'll get you under the, and, we, and maybe we'll even help you do that. Gosnell's mm-hmm. the only clinic we know of where they said this is unredeemable. We can't have them come under wow. the, 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 our, our, our network. Wow. But they didn't go to any government officials. They didn't call the police. We don't know exactly what that person saw, I don't think, but we know it was bad enough that they said we can't have them under. So for me, if you really care about women, about their health and their safety, and if you really care about late-term babies, why would you not say anything? This thing was hidden by pro-abortion leaders and and is I don't I how can you blame pro-lifers it's crazy to me well we definitely have a lot of content to put into practice when we start conversations about this issue um, thank you so much Megan for coming on to our show this is Megan Glad Allman from here. Life Training Institute mm-hmm. she is a presenter and blogger um, you can learn more about her at prolifetraining.com you can always go to our website for more information about our show that's prolifepodcast.net thanks and that's our show You've been watching Life Report, Pro-Life Talk, Real World Answers. Life Report is produced by Right to Life of Central California. Visit their website at fresnoprolife.org. Since the recording of this episode, Kermit Gosnell was convicted of three charges of first-degree murder, as well as involuntary manslaughter for the woman that died in his clinic. He is going to jail for the rest of his life. I have three feelings about Kermit Gosnell that I explain more fully in a new article posted at joshbrom.com. One, I'm glad limited justice has been served. Two, I'm glad he's going to prison. And three, I don't want Gosnell to go to hell. I'd rather spend time with him in heaven. I don't think writing in all caps that I hope God's now burns in hell, like some are, is a virtuous response for a Christian. I know a lot of people are going to hell, but I'd rather nobody does. I'd rather everybody converts first, and that includes evil men like Kermit Gosnell. I would like to hang out with a converted Gosnell in heaven for some of the same reasons I want to hang out with Paul in heaven. It would be more evidence of how amazing God's grace actually is. To read this article and share with your friends, please visit joshbrom.com.